First question on this episode, a question from subs came from my guy Derek Flox. He said, Hey Graven, my name is Derek. Been watching the channel for some time now. Uh, first time I found you was back in Madden 16 era when you were still doing Madden content. Since then, I always kept up with Team Keep It Clean. I appreciate that, Derek. That Madden, yeah, Madden's what got everything started. Uh, we had a lot of fun in Madden, but of course, um, we still play Madden, but just don't record it because I just fell out of love with recording it. That's when it, when it became like a chore. I was like, Oh no, this. I ain't recording this no more uh, But yeah So everything worked out In the long run obviously But I, I appreciate you for um, Sticking around That's a lot For Madden 16 Oh no no He said actually Madden 15 era uh, The one with Richard Sherman On the front Oh wow you Okay I, I appreciate you man uh, And he said also I was thinking Maybe Deuce Keith Mitchell uh, Wasn't used much In the Browns game Because we have to see The Bengals on Thursday And we don't want them To have much film On him We all know he's bound To break out So the less film They have to study on him the better so could that be the reason the Baltimore Ravens were hiding out Keaton Mitchell in that second half of the game I have heard that before and I've heard some people say that too like oh yeah maybe they were just holding them out because we got the Bengals but both of them are division games maybe it was the Ravens sort of overlooking the Browns that's one thing I could think of possibly maybe they were like you know what Browns, we whooped them already. Yeah, they got Deshaun Watson back, but we whooped them. Oh, we, we went up seventeen three on them. Oh, we went up twenty four nine. We we was up by the we was up by fourteen points. We got that. Keaton, just chill. You you don't need to do nothing, Keaton Mitchell. You don't need to do nothing else. Wrong. They lost. Uh, so you need to bring out whoever. You don't need to be keeping no secrets from nobody in this game coming up against the Bengals. Next question came from my guy Harry, who's also a Team Keep It Clean patron. He said, hey, what's good, Engraven? And the Team Keep It Clean family, hope everyone is doing well and everyone is staying blessed. I haven't really said anything this year because I've been content with the team for the most part. My question for today is, when do you fire Harbaugh? He has been the weak link for this team and has been for years. He's bad at clock management. He doesn't call plays. His situational awareness is atrocious, etc. Just like up in New England, they are realizing it was more of Brady than Belichick. We as Ravens fans need to realize it was more of Ed, Ray, Joe, and Anquan than we give them credit for. We have one of the most talented teams in football every year, and I would love to see what we could do or what we could be if we also had one of the most talented coaches. I don't think really I need to say anything further. We all watched the games this season and seen why we lost the games why didn't we run Mitchell more why use the clock why did we let up instead of applying pressure etc so he's asking a question why or when would or should the Ravens fire John Harbaugh now y'all know already John Harbaugh is probably one of the safest coaches in the league and there have been times when I felt like, yeah, that the Ravens should have moved on. Definitely points last year, the year before last at times, too, uh, and previous years before that sometimes as well. Um, but we know that John Harbaugh is safe. He, he is extremely safe. The only way John Harbaugh is not the Ravens head coach is if he decides to hang it up, if he decides to walk out on his own terms. I just do not foresee any scenario whatsoever, like nothing. I don't see any scenario at all. Where the Baltimore Ravens fired John Harbaugh. I just don't. I don't. And I know we heard the rumors about, yeah, everything going on up there in New England. And he obviously, his name holds more weight than John Harbaugh Belichick's does with all them Super Bowls that they got and whatnot. And they, there was a talk of, oh, they could mutually part ways at the end of the year and da 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 da. Remember back in, um, I think it was 2018, when that report came out about John Harbaugh with the Ravens, that they could mutually part ways. Remember that? But anyway, um, he's safe. John Harbaugh ain't going nowhere unless John Harbaugh decides to go somewhere. Now, this season, um, I'm not, like, right now, I, I know a lot of people are, uh, but I'm not like, oh, yeah, let's, let's fire John Harbaugh. They need to fire John Harbaugh right here, right now. Now, depending on how this season goes, then it could be a conversation. But, yeah, the losses have been atrocious stuff that's happened to the Baltimore Ravens. Got to give credit to the other teams, too. Um, but the losses have, the self-inflicted wounds have been big. I know it's been a lack of preparation in some of them games that, like you mentioned, the, the poor clock uh, management, the time management and whatnot. Um, but I, I'm, not with, I'm not on the, oh, fire hardball right now. No, no not after three losses, no. Uh, now we, we have been seeing patterns. We have been seeing some patterns at the Baltimore Ravens. Actually have been, been patterns for years. So what I hope the Baltimore Ravens can do, and I know a lot of people are going to be like, oh, well, if you, that's what you hope for, just look at the past couple of years. Look, what, look what's happened. But what I hope is that the Baltimore Ravens, they can all learn from their mistakes 
and they can improve things moving forward, uh, especially come postseason time. The offense is a big issue. Next question coming from my guy, the legit GOAT. He said, Ain't great, man. Wish nothing but peace and happiness for you in the Baltimore community after that stressful game. Uh, appreciate that. He said, Defense played good in the first half, but we can't expect the defense to be on the field for almost 40 minutes and expect them to continue to keep up with the Browns' high powered offense. When you have weapons like Amari Cooper and Joku and Kareem Hunt plus Deshaun Watson, you have to account for there's only so much that the defense can do. That's fair. Uh, the play caller wasn't great in this game. If it wasn't for the pick six and a turnover by Prochet in our red zone, the score would have been 16-33. to 33. Browns winning. Why didn't we continue to run Mitchell? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Why are we using Gus on first and 10 knowing he's our goal line running back? Uh, see, now with that part, I disagree with that part. Uh, you can use Gus. Uh, Gus could run it on any down. Um, so, yeah, I disagree with that part. But anyway, continuing, he said, uh, why didn't well, yeah why didn't we continue to run with Mitchell um uh knowing and he said why didn't we run on Gus with first and ten he's our goal line running back uh not our go out and run for a forty yard touchdown he's capable of doing that but these last two games have shown that Mitchell only needs one touch to make a big play. Ronnie Stanley has been very underwhelming, ranked almost at the bottom of the league in his position this year. Something needs to be done. His injury issue is hurting the offensive line. This is not 2001 or 2013 where you can rely on just the defense to win games, at least not in today's football. If the offense doesn't figure this out, especially with the turnover situations we're having, don't expect us to get past the Chiefs, which has a way better offense than the Browns and a top five defense in the league right now. Hope we come back next week against the Bengals because if not, we will drop from first to third or fourth in our division, which will put us in a hole, especially with our remaining schedule. Mm. He said a lot right here. Um, now, uh, with the offense, and yeah, that, you just, again, he was talking about how the offense is a big issue. My opinion, um, the offensive line is a huge issue. Uh, when the offensive line crumbles, that's when you see Ravens offense fall apart, especially, more specifically, their passing offense. When the offensive line crumbles, uh, because we've we've seen it. Like you, you give Lamar time, that's it. He he'll tear you apart. But teams like oh no, we willing to send everything. We willing to risk it just so we don't give Lamar Jackson time. Now there are also times when Lamar Jackson, uh, when he doesn't have time and he still makes stuff happen. Uh, but that's a little bit harder. But when you give him time, it's game over. But teams been like, um, we gonna try to take that away, especially the Browns. Um, now, uh. Lamar Jackson did have time on the first interception that he threw. I know a lot of people saying that maybe, maybe he, since he got rocked, like I think it was the play before or maybe a couple plays before where he got rocked on the sideline, that sideline hit, uh, maybe they said he was feeling a little woozy or something like that because, again, that throw to Rashad Bateman, like what was that? What was, that, that was terrible. That was terrible, all kinds of terrible. Um, so I, I don't know what that was, but I think everything starts up front in the offensive line. Ravens, they lost the battle uh, against the Browns in the trenches on offense and defense uh, because on offense, couldn't block for nothing. On defense, they couldn't stop the run for nothing, especially right, right up the gut. Uh, so the trenches got to get figured out. Now, again, they're 7-3, and three, so they obviously got stuff figured out for the most part. Um, so it, it's, it could be a little deeper than the trenches like my guy Harry was talking about. Uh, but... The Ravens, like, they're they in a good position. I'm, I'm glad we can have these conversations to where we we're obviously frustrated at some stuff that the Baltimore Ravens do, frustrated in the type of games that they lose, frustrated with the way that they lose. Um, but the fact that they're 7-3 and three and we can have these conversations instead of them being 3-7 and seven and us talking about this, that says a lot. So they have a, ch a chance to turn it around. They got an opportunity to really get this thing right Thursday night. <laughs> That will be a perfect start. Overreaction or justified? Next question came from my guy Aaron. He said, hey, engraving and team, keep it clean. Hope all is well. After Sunday's tough loss to the Cleveland Browns, the Ravens have received criticism. Much of it is warranted. You're right. Uh, but after watching Shannon Sharp's comments on his shows, Nightcap and First Take about the Ravens, specifically when it comes to Lamar Jackson, do you think his take is valid criticism and something to be concerned about? Or is it just another weekly overreaction by Shannon Sharp on his former team? Appreciate all that you do and hope you and your family uh, have a blessed coming up. Appreciate that, man. Thank you, Aaron. Now, um, Shannon Sharp, I think he talked about uh, that. <laughs> I think he said he can't trust Lamar Jackson now after that game. He brought up all of Lamar Jackson's turnovers, where there have been a, a lot of them. Um, well, some are definitely his fault. Some couldn't do anything about it, but they're there. They are the numbers. They are, again, you got to have context, though, but they are what the numbers are. But um, he talked about how he can't trust Lamar Jackson. 
if all it takes is one day, and, and I know trust is one of the easiest things to lose. It's one of the toughest things to build up. Um, but just last week, Shannon Sharp was saying, oh, yeah, Lamar Jackson, these Ravens, oh, yeah, they're one of the best teams in the NFL. Lamar Jackson playing like an MVP. Da, 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 da. And after this one game where they lost, on the last second field goal, he said he can't trust them. So with Lamar Jackson, one, one thing that uh, Rita brought up, the NFL chick, she made a really good point. She talked about how with Shannon Sharp, he knows the game. He, he knows the business of media and that he knows that anything he says about Lamar Jackson is going to get a lot of people riled up. It's going to get a lot of people upset and it's going to have all eyes on whatever he's saying because hey, it's Lamar Jackson. Uh, and whether the Shannon Sharp used to be a Raven or not, uh, like I don't really think that has much to do with it um, because he's, he's in the media. He's in the media, so that's his job to talk about whatever's going on with whatever player. Uh, but with Lamar Jackson, his name is very polarizing. Um, so I think Shannon Sharp just taking advantage of that. Uh, so I, um, I don't like – Lamar Jackson could have an amazing game against the Bengals, and then you'll see Shannon Sharp turn right back around. Oh, man, oh yeah, that's, hey, that's Lamar Jackson that I know. That, 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 that's him. That's him. That's the one, Stephen A. So it, it'll go right back to the same thing. So, I mean, you can't take it too serious. And the last question on this episode came from my guy, Flirt Nowinski. He said, what's good, bro? Hope all is well per usual. I hope all is well with you and your promotion that you got. I hope that that nice office that you said you got, you're sitting, sitting pretty in there, chilling, put your feet up on the desk and whatnot, drinking some nice orange juice in the morning, or maybe some tea or coffee if you do that. I don't drink coffee, though, but I hope everything going good with you, my guy. Anyway, he said... Now, I know what you're thinking. Like, man, he's about to come on here and trash McDonald for sitting in that young cover, too, and losing that last game. You know what's funny? While I was watching that game, toward the end, I saw them sitting in that zone. And I said, oh, oh, yeah. That's, yeah, I, I thought about you, man. But anyway, he said, no, I will never do that. I've been saying the same thing the last two seasons and no need to speak on it anymore. Or the Steelers lost when you have a cornerback quarter, one-on-one -on -one, fresh off an injury. One-on-one. -on -one. With nothing over the top, uh, with the game on the line, when the only thing they could do was throw a nine route. Uh, enough about him, though. Mm, a little, little pettiness right there. But anyway, he said, but I know this sounds crazy, but I do believe that Lamar let the media get to him. Our line has never been good, let's be honest, but all the years, whenever he would see a lane, if he doesn't see a good anticipated throw to make, he would take off. He stopped that. He just pats the ball. Lamar let the media accomplish their mission. And as you can see, that's all they talk about because that's all they can say. But I don't know if I said this before, but what do you think? Oh, okay. Before that, that first part, that's an interesting way to look at it. Um, the way that I looked at it is that, yeah, I, I, yeah, I've said something similar years past because I remember it was the Texans game in, I want to say, 2020. Um, yeah, that was the COVID year. Uh, with the empty stadium but i remember lamar he dropped back had the ball had a lane right in front of him wasn't taking it had, had it it was right there he would have got a nice chunk of yards but he didn't take it and i saw it back then i'm like what's like what's going on why is he not take so it, it seems as if yeah his game has changed over the years but this year has been different because he's he's been doing a lot of, a lot of that same stuff. But I just think the way that I looked at it was that he was just preserving himself uh, for the long haul, preserving himself uh, for the rest of the season and whatnot, and just holding back. Um, but that could be something too. That that could really be something too because we've seen that happen before. We've seen that happen before. Like literally, I think I don't remember in his rookie year we saw it happen. We've seen it other times, too, we, and we know that Lamar Jackson, and, and that's one thing about Lamar Jackson, he lets it be known a lot of times that he does listen to what the media is saying. Now, recently, he hasn't really been letting it be known, but we remember times before he may make a comment or something, he went, oh, not bad for a running back, right? When he did all that, like, so he sees all that stuff. I mean, it's hard for him not to see it. He go on social media for two seconds, he's going to be tagged in, like, a million different things. Um... But I, I, never, I didn't think about that, like maybe L Lamar Jackson letting the media get to him and that's why he's not running as much uh, to like to, pl to play prove it ball, to play prove it ball to the media and be like, oh, see, I, I don't need to take off like that. Um, so I know my guy Mike, he was saying it during the game last week against the Browns. He's like, man, Lamar, like he has that ability. Use it. Use it. That's what makes him extra special. Just use it. So show, show people. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. I, I think that's we'll keep watching as the season goes along. I mean, we already got ten games of evidence uh, to see that. Yeah, he he doesn't just take off um, as much as he used to. 
Uh, so I guess we'll see how things go moving forward. Now, that's a really good observation. Uh, something else he said, I don't know if I said this before, but why do you think they didn't trade Geno or Stone or Justin Matabike? He said, I know. He said, I know, I know. Why would you trade them? Uh, I was thinking they were going to trade at least one when we all know they're both gone, but at least one. Man, Stanley gave me PTSD. Why do you think they didn't send one of them off? And just like Lamar was when he got flipped, I'm out. <laughs> Uh, this, uh, this, man, let me give that to get back to that trade question. It would have been a bad move if they would have traded either one of them. It would have been a terrible move. Uh, reason being because Matabike, that's your sack leader. So you you would trade you would trade their sack leader and their interception leader. Like really, their, their, their sack leader and their interception leader. You get rid of them? No, man. No, 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 no. And I don't even think it's a given that even both of them are gone. Uh, somebody asked a question uh, last week, and I actually picked both of them two to stay, and Patrick Queen to unfortunately be the odd man. I would, I would love to keep Patrick Queen. I would love for him to stay, um, but I picked those two that I think the Ravens could get it something worked out with them. Now, hey, hopefully they can get something done with all three. But I honestly wouldn't be surprised if they only got something done with one of them because it's a tough business, man. It's a really tough business. And these guys, they trying to make their money. They ain't trying to take no discounts or nothing like that. And I do not blame them whatsoever. But yeah, you don't, you wouldn't, it would, it would be foolish for the Ravens to have traded one of them, uh, especially at safety position. Marcus Williams has been injured, still is injured. And if they would have traded Geno Stone, and then the only safety that you got uh, is an injured Marcus Williams, or well, not the only safety, but you know what I'm saying that that he would, it would just be on him. Nah, that would have been a bad decision. Then when Matt BK, it's like. A lot of times you can struggle to get pressure when you don't blitz, but you got somebody that can bring that interior pressure that, that has been a closer when it's been when it's come to sacks in Justin Matabeek, and you will get rid of it. No, you can't do none of that. So I'm glad that Geno Stone and Matabeek are not like the end of these videos and out.